Welcome everyone. This is a colloquium discussion on volunteer engagement leadership and COVID-19 reflections and future directions for research and practice. So my name is Allison Russell and I'm assistant professor of public and nonprofit management at the University of Texas at Dallas and I'll be moderating the panel this morning um, and I'm really excited about the panelists that we have with us. Um, the purpose of this discussion is really just to chat together about how COVID-19 has affected the volunteer engagement leadership and volunteer administration profession and practice. Um, and our goal was to convene um, some experts with us from both the practice practitioner lens as well as the research lens. Um, and so we have a good mix of that here with us. And uh, we're excited to have this conversation and to see, you know, what, where, what we've been dealing with in the past couple of years, but also what is the way forward? Um, what do we see as the future of the profession? And also what are some questions and considerations for both practitioners and researchers um, who study volunteering going forward? So I'll introduce um, our panelists this morning. So um, first we have Melissa Heinlein Storty, who currently serves as the chief at the Center for Development and Civic Engagement at the Corporal Michael J. Crescens Veterans Affairs Medical Center located in Philadelphia. Um, and Melissa has uh, been with the VA um, for quite a while. She is also a member of our NOVA and a researcher as well. Um, so we're excited to have her here and have her perspectives. Um, we also have with us Betsy McFarland, who is a strategist and problem solver, who has forged a unique professional niche focused on empowering staff and volunteers committed to tackling challenging societal issues. Um, she has a 20-year career in animal protection. Um, she created the Humane Society National Volunteer Effort, which is a broad-scale effort that engages thousands of volunteers globally. Um, and she's also a consultant who's worked with many different organizations, as well as with universities. Um, so it's great to have you, Betsy. Thanks for being here. And then we have uh, Mark Hager, who is Associate Professor of Nonprofit Leadership and Management at Arizona State University. Um, and he recently has completed data collection on two AmeriCorps funded projects related to volunteer administration and is also working on a book on the barriers that volunteer administrators face to adopting uh, technology in their practice. And um, he has, of course, some insights on that in the context of COVID. Um, and he's also done a bunch of other things. So we're really excited to have you with us as well, Mark. Um, so with that, I'm going to open up for the first question. Um, and just a couple of things for our audience as well. Um, so, um, you know, if, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat or at Towards the end, I'll give an opportunity to for the audience to ask questions verbally as well, so you'll be able to unmute and ask questions. Um, so, you know, but if you have something on your mind, don't hesitate to type it in the chat. Um, we're excited to have you here. All right, so the first question that I have is just since the pandemic began, what has stayed the same with the process of volunteer engagement and what has changed? So I'll start, I'll pass it off to you, Melissa, if you wanna get us started. Make sure I go off of mute. <laughs> Thanks, Allison. So it's been really interesting when the pandemic hit. I'm in healthcare. So what we had found is that the community was the same. They were just really looking for an opportunity to help. Um, what had really changed though, is that we weren't ready for it. Um, in the field, we had to pivot incredibly quickly, and we didn't really know how to do that. You have emergency management plans that you put in place and you practice, but um, the community was ready, I think, before we were. Um, the other thing was that, you know, there were some departments um, in the field who, if they didn't pivot quickly, they were allocated to other departments. And then that particular volunteer department ended up being on hold. Um, and some actually had collapsed and you know they, they did not have that volunteer engagement leader anymore. So it was um, heartbreaking, but also exhilarating to see the changes that were going on. 
Um, but the biggest thing is that the community was ready um, and we had to act very, very quickly to get where they were so they can help us fulfill the mission of our organization at the time. I'll build on that if that's okay. Um, if I just step in, I don't know if you wanted to call on us, uh, but I'll just jump in. So I, I, I would concur with everything Melissa said. And just to add to that, I think um, one of the things I found really interesting about the pandemic is I, I have a long history of also doing disaster response. I mean, Melissa, you alluded to the disaster response issue um, and you know, hurricanes, floods, whatever those things are. And I think in a way, this was such a different kind of disaster. I think one thing that struck me was in every other disaster I've worked, which is quite a few, everyone runs to the disaster, right? But in this case, so many of the people who normally step up and act were asked to stay home. And that I think was a real challenge because I think it was really, and still is, because so many still are as sitting at home idle, uh, was super frustrating for volunteers. And I heard that through, you know, a lot of the clients I work with, since I do a lot of consulting work with different organizations in working even with their volunteers, it was, why can't we help more? What can we do? You know, and some, some sectors did, like Melissa, you said, they pivoted more quickly. I saw food banks were much more, because they had to, right? Like there was no choice. They had to figure this out fast. But others were really struggling and just kept asking volunteers to stay back. And I think that created some tension and challenge. And I think a lot of organizations have lost their volunteer teams as a result. Um, I think the other thing I'll mention uh, was that I thought was noteworthy that made this different is, well, I guess it's not different in the sense that every time there's a crisis, there's lots of informal and spontaneous volunteers who step up to help. But that was a real thing that I saw um, quite a bit uh, in the beginning of the pandemic. You know, you saw uh, these informal kind of organizations forming like shopping angels and things where people were just naturally trying to help people who were at home and couldn't go grocery shopping out of fear of being sick. You know, these spontaneous volunteers were self-organizing. I mean, I saw them online creating Google Docs of their, here's how we do it. Here's what we're trying to do. And they were sort of building the plane as they flew it without the support of a more formal organization. And I thought that was pretty interesting and kind of exciting too. I mean, I think there are things we can learn from that where, you know, the bigger, maybe some of the or more structured organizations in some cases struggled more where the spontaneous organizations kind of filled in some of those gaps while they were trying to figure it out. At least that's how I was seeing it from my own perspective. I didn't see any, I mean, I wasn't looking for any of that and I didn't get out of my house as much as I would have liked to in the pandemic. Um, the the self-organizing, I mean, it's nice when people have initiative. Is there a lot of that though? Does it have much impact? Uh, are there downside dangers of that and people, you know, working outside of, of organization. And I asked that thinking about what little I know about emergency management, the concerns that professionals have when, when, when helpful people just show up and you gotta say, you know, you need to be, you know, you need to be vetted and safe and, and you're not, and so we need you to leave. Uh, so I don't know, Betsy, what do you think? No, I agree with you. I think there's some pros and cons to it, right? And I think there's just something for us to pay attention to and recognize like, why was that happening? Um, what do we need to do about that? I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I think it's a, a another reality check that organizations need to be ready for when these types of events are happening. And it seems like, again, anecdotally from my experience, organizations who are already really good at engaging their volunteers and were doing it in ways that were pretty deep and volunteers had a pretty significant role. I feel like they, they were able to do it a little more quickly than others where they just sort of said, wait, we're just gonna put you on hold until we figure it out, which kind of leads me to that. Are their volunteers something they need to have or do they feel there's something that they just don't really care about, right? Like it just seemed, it illustrates to me again, some of those gaps in how organizations are engaging volunteers and what we're missing maybe. Well, and, and in some respects, the volunteers were willing to go along the journey with us, right? So right. even though we didn't have like all of the T's crossed and I's dotted, you know, they were, willing to be with us to kind of help figure it out, you know, and, and have, you know, brainstorming sessions as to how it would work, you know, what would the online training look like? What would the background checks and the screening look like? You know, they didn't want to feel isolated because while they were still at home, they were still able to connect with us, you know, like through the phone, email, Zoom sessions, 
Um, and, and I think that was, you know, for myself, like a, a deficiency, like I, I felt like I needed to figure it out on my own, but there were plenty of people like lining up virtually to be like, let us help you, you know, figure it out. And I think that was another thing that at least, you know, I've seen the organizations where, and I was encouraging my clients along that way to say, even if they can't be with you, you have to be doing a lot of, it's like a time of extra, extra, extra communication, right? Because they needed that transparency and keeping people informed is what probably kept them staying with you. Whereas many organizations who didn't do that, those volunteers sort of vaporized. Yeah. So... Allison's question is about what's changed and stayed the same in the pandemic regarding volunteer administration. And as I considered this question, um, uh, I, you know, I, th I think that the question, the answer is broader than that. I don't know what there's anything particularly unique to volunteer administration. It's that they are embedded in nonprofit organizations. They're embedded in communities and all of those things have been in, uh, affected in the pandemic. Um, I think my few observations off the top here aren't going to be different from what Betsy and Melissa have said. You know, we don't have any crazy contrarians in the panel that are going to lead us in new directions, I think. So uh, I, but you guys are more on the ground than me. I get, I'm a little more, uh, what do you say, sort of, uh, you know, have my fingers on the pulse that I do on some other projects because I'm coming off uh, in the spring and the summer, just 2021 of this year, uh, having had uh, 181 uh, certified volunteer administrators. You see the CBA and Betsy's title right there. Um, participate in focus groups with uh, with my research team at Arizona State. And so, you know, they got to go on and on as long as they wanted about uh, what was going on in their organizations and how they were using technology to engage. And, you know, they, they, they talked about issues and we, we pursued particular kinds of issues, but, you know, big themes come out of that. And, and one is sort of goes to Allison's question. It has to do with just how disruptive the pandemic has been to, to operations. Um, I think if, if volunteer work wasn't a life and death kind of thing, like it might be in like delivering meals to old folks that are shut in or something like that, um, or organizations uh, early in the pandemic, and some of them still now, I mean, more than a year later, are, are suspending operations when they can. Uh, I am this semester not working at my office in downtown Phoenix, uh, but instead in what I call embedding in a, in a nonprofit organization in my neighborhood where I'm meeting uh, every day with, my, with a graduate student to work on, on this work specifically. And that was really attractive to me to work in a nonprofit organization and had volunteers run around and a professional volunteer administrator. And, and it, it hasn't worked out that way. I mean, it's been great by and large. Um, and we have lunch regularly with the volunteer administrator, but there are no volunteers running around because they haven't reestablished efforts to bring volunteers back into a largely volunteer run organization. And, you know, I suspect that's not atypical. I think that where, where volunteers were essential, organizations have tried to find various ways to continue operations. But when they're, uh, you know, maybe just about civic engagement uh, or, or, or things that aren't life and death, I think nonprofits are still holding off uh, here now, you know, 18, I, I should do the math, you know, well, you know, into the yeah, second year of a pandemic from, from, uh, from bringing volunteers into their, into their operations. So the big change, I guess you would say, and, and this is not strange to anyone, is uh, nonprofits have gone all in on, on what are called ICTs, information and communication technologies. Uh, Zoom is maybe our best example, Teams. Uh, in order to uh, communicate with volunteers. There's another class of ICT that's, that's sort of bloomed in the pandemic, and that's the use of social media. Uh, so there's a lot more of that going on, uh, creative applications of that, wrestling with how those are going to work in organizations. Um, it's not new, as I say, but organizations had to double down or experiment in, with the use of these ICTs uh, in order to best engage their volunteers. And even if the volunteers aren't doing anything, they want to stay in communication with them as best they can uh, so they don't lose them entirely. So we had, for example, uh, one library uh, that, you know, in normal times is uh, having uh, one group of elderly folks doing readings in person with, a you know, a group of kids. 
some that the library did to both, you know, promote, uh, you know, reading and, uh, you know, interaction between, uh, uh, be between generations. Well, you can't do that, but they've been pretty innovative in gathering people in through social media and connecting uh, with, with, uh, with the Zoom uh, in order to deliver programs in, in neat sorts of ways. And, uh, you know, what they do with that in the future, well, I'm not sure I'll have some comments about that on some of the later questions, I, I think. But um, uh, right now, at least, we're still seeing a lot of double down on information and communication technologies. Um, some volunteering still going on, people returning, but it's just under various degrees of the COVID protocols. It's who knows what next month's going to look like or, or even next year. I concur with everything you said. I mean, I saw quite a few clients trying to figure out, and I think folks were struggling to figure out what could volunteers do virtually? How could we use some of these technologies? You know, the ment it seemed like where it was person to person volunteering, like mentoring, reading books to kids, visiting with people, those seemed right. naturally and pretty easy to shift to Zoom and people were doing a pretty good job at that. And I saw yeah. others of, um, folks kind of really struggling to say, well, I want to keep our volunteers engaged. There's things we need to do, but I don't know how to move that to a virtual setting. So I think that's going to be an ongoing issue as we navigate all of this. Yeah, I mean, huge, you know, city parks, state park systems. It's like, yeah, we rely on hundreds to a thousand volunteers every year, but we haven't done this in months. You know, we don't know when we're going to do this again. And, uh, you know, that's, that's too bad. Uh, um, but you know, I don't know. In the big scheme of things, I guess we won't have we won't have those trails cleaned up for a while. I, yeah, I know. Yeah, it's tricky. It's almost like well, and where it could be fully outside, it seems like at least that allows for some social distancing, and they were able to do some, just reduce numbers, or yeah. all virtual. It's almost like the in between inside a facility. It seems to me where a lot of people are really struggling. I know I work still work with quite a few humane organizations animal shelters and the like. And, um, you know, they, I've seen a lot of them starting to kind of slowly work their way back to bringing volunteers on site. They did things in the beginning where it was like volunteers didn't come inside, but staffs would bring them dogs to walk or something where they didn't, you know, they could reduce interaction. And then they began to work on different teams, like volunteer teams, like staff teams. So they work in pods so that it kind of reduces. And if, if anybody ended up sick, they could contact trace, right? So I've seen a lot of different models people are trying to use. But so it's been pretty interesting to watch them navigate it um, and try to figure it out. But yeah, it's, it feels like everyone thought this would just be a sprint. You know, we all thought a couple of months we'll get through this. <laughs> I don't know that anyone really, maybe the epidemiologists, but I don't know that anybody really anticipated two years later, we'd still be here trying to figure out what we're supposed to do. <laughs> That's a great segue to the second question. I don't want to cut off Melissa, but uh, yeah. I Allison, why don't you go to that second question because Betsy's already right on it. Yeah, yeah. So the second question was, how has the role of volunteer departments and volunteer engagement leaders shifted within broader organizational structures since this pandemic began? Yeah, and I think, you know, and Betsy's already talking about it. It's this, it's this remote engagement. It's just so different than what we were doing two years ago. And there's some element of that in some organizations, but I think, you know, the nonprofits generally and our volunteer administrators specifically have been forced to, to try to find new ways to engage their volunteers. And so in, in the study that I did, we asked um, uh, how many of you are working remotely as volunteer administrators and to what extent is that due to the pandemic? And over half of the CBAs we talked to said that they were uh, usually or always working remotely at the time. And that wasn't typical for them. These are, I like to think of, you know, volunteer mm -hmm. administrators as people people. You know, they're mostly in the mix, you know, having a lot of face-to-face -face interaction. That's where a lot of the great value is. But um, two-thirds of our survey respondents said that the pandemic had greatly influenced this need for them to be working pandemic, uh, be working remotely. So, I mean, it could have been now they're working remotely, but they always have. But no, it was, as we might guess, uh, due to the pandemic. Um, nonprofits like, you know, restaurants and other kinds of places, if they could send workers home, uh, they did. If they could find ways to work remotely, they did. We're, we're seeing a, a lot of that. Um, so I think as a consequence of that, our visibility of our volunteer administrators would be decreased uh, within their organizational structures, um, especially if they have no volunteers, if that's suspended, 
it's almost like you never see that person. Um, and and, and uh, even if the volunteers are there and they're working remotely, you don't see people around the water cooler. You don't have the kinds of conversations you might have. So for a field, I think that struggles for visibility and respect within their own organizational structures, I think working from home doesn't help very much. Uh, that's I've got a couple of different thoughts on this question, but that's my first overture there. Yeah, and I wanted to add on that, Mark, because you were talking about reporting structure. So pre-COVID, you know, we were seen as that department, you know, like, oh, like the niceties, right? And, you know, labeled as like, you know, Julie from the Love Boat and like doing all these awesome things for the organization. Um, but once COVID hit, you know, it was more of you need to be a part of the incident command chain, you know, like where before it wasn't that case. So that kind of goes back to that emergency management piece. You know, it was also being more heavily engaged. You know, if you had a very strong volunteer engagement leader pre-COVID, then I think you had better success in the midst of it because then leadership was able to see you as critical than now to the organization. Um, you know, being on incident command meetings and what were you able to do? You know, the donations of PPE became critical, you know, supporting the staff, you know, to that was supporting local restaurants who were able to hire back some of their team members and then bringing food back in, you know, to the hospital. So there was a greater visibility with senior leadership to see that we were beyond just like the human resource of the organization for those in an unpaid position, but now seeing that we can also contribute very strategically, you know, and be that link between the organization and the community. So that was, you know, really important during this time. That's a good positive thing then. <laughs> That's nice to hear actually, because I know a number of the organizations, at least early on, I was hearing, were either furloughing or laying off their volunteer administrators or their volunteer managers in the interim saying, well, if there aren't any volunteers, we can lay you off or they were being diverted to other work, like asked to just work on other things or do other, other projects <clears throat> and, or even to do themselves the work their volunteers would normally do, which was another thing we were seeing. So it's, um, you know, I think that, again, is one of those illustrations of, of, you know, how do we value this population of folks who are donating their time to our organizations and the person who's leading them? And I think we still have a lot of disconnects, which I think we'll talk about later and, and what that looks like and where it needs to be in organizations. Um, so, yeah, I think um, so many, well, I guess one thing I would add is, <clears throat> given now where things stand, I'm hearing too, the volunteer managers who are you know, still very engaged, a lot of them have come back if they were laid off, but um, are, are just trying to even navigate what are the future structures of volunteer engagement look while we're still in the pandemic. For example, you know, working with, <clears throat> I work some with the National Park Service and others, and um, you know, they, they're navigating trying to figure out, okay, we now have a vaccine mandate, how does this apply to volunteers? And how do we handle all the, because we have, hundreds of thousands of volunteers we you know that we, so we usually have more volunteers than even staff so how do we handle that volume of questions the volume of um you know exemptions or people saying well i have this exemption to getting the vaccine or i'm going to do it this way right like how do they navigate that and i think in a way it feels like that's sucking a lot of people's time just trying to figure out what does it look like to even engage volunteers responsibly right now and in that role is is kind of being pushed that direction so i don't know if you're seeing that melissa as a government agency as well well, and as a government agency, so anything that is applying to staff is, you know, applying to volunteers. So pre-COVID, it was that you had to have your flu vaccination in order to be a part of it. So now, you know, it's, we have to see that documentation for your COVID vaccine. Um, you know, and I know we'll, you know, talk about some of the processes and strategies, you know, but we've been able to shift to volunteers who can still give, but now they're virtual because they're virtual because they don't want to have the vaccine or, you know, they're, they don't have it right now. So we'll, I'll pause there on that one because that'll affect another question. But um, it has been heartbreaking that when I would send emails to my local Dovia, you know, and how many um, emails came back of people who were either no longer in the position or, you know, they're, they're no longer with that organization. So that was really heartbreaking, you know, to see that people were just no longer in those jobs. 
Now, Betsy, I hadn't considered that question. It seems to me that um, if there's such a mandate uh, that volunteers also be vaccinated, that technology can go a long ways in, uh, you know, just sort of smoothing the bureaucratic process on that. Do you think organizations are going to push back or, or or not get down this road because they see it as burdensome or is it something they'll be able to tackle? I think they'll be able to tackle it. I think it's more just, I mean, that's my gut is I think they have no choice but to tackle it. But I think it was just interesting in the conversations I've had with some of the leaders of volunteers, they're saying, well, now I'm kind of, a lot of my time is being spent just trying to figure out how to make this process work, right? Um, because it's new and because people have a lot of questions, there's some hesitancy. And then there's, you know, is, is it, if you don't vaccinate, are you having to be tested? It's just, it's, it's just the, um, it's like the protocol of it and just trying to deal with it on the fly when it's something they haven't had to do before. If it, and, and I'm not hearing that from everyone because I think some organizations, you know, have their, their, the way they're handling it. It just feels like, especially for the large organizations, like I heard it from a colleague at the National Park Service where the volume is just such that it's a lot of people. Um, and that's why I kind of look to you, Melissa. I think you're the probably the, the, the best corollary there. So you might be better to speak to it than me, but um, you know, that's just what I've been hearing. Yeah, and you know, being on healthcare, but even those who, you know, in my local areas that are not in healthcare, you know, that mandate has been, you know, critical, um, you know, in order to protect their clients, their patients, their, you know, their staff and their and their selves. But again, giving them an opportunity that if you still want to give back, you can do so virtually. But unfortunately, we can't have you be face to face when you know, for so many organizations that what we're, that's what we're used to. We're used to holding hands and, you know, and being right up front for people. So it's, it's been a change. It's been a challenge. For sure. So uh, I had the great opportunity to visit with Allison in person. Uh, she uh, and her colleagues in Dallas invited me to come talk about this uh, volunteer administration project with her, their, their students and faculty uh, last month. So that was awesome. Uh, so she, she got to hear some of the broad conclusions that are coming out of the, the survey data. And you know, I won't spend time going through that now, but one of the kickers had to do with um, sort of the, the, uh, the, 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 how the volunteer administrators are um, uh, sort of, um, their characteristics when it comes to uh, their choice to use different kinds of technologies, not just the what I call the information communication technologies, but also the more bureaucratic kinds of technologies. So, right, Betsy, you're saying, you know, you need a system in place to check for, uh, you know, the COVID vaccination, and that's not different from keeping track of background checks or how many volunteer, what are volunteer schedules? So, you know, a Volgistics or a, a Better Impact or some of our sort of desktop technologies as opposed to sort of our information and, and communication technologies. And, uh, you know, the stories uh, that Melissa and Betsy are telling are, 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 you know, pretty positive for some of these, I think, larger organizations with dedicated volunteer administrators. Um, I think by and large though, across the field, there's a lot of disarray um, organizations um, that don't, you know, provide the resources for volunteer administration, uh, allow uh, individuals, whether they're trained or not, to put time into the management of their, their volunteers. Um, so I, what we found is a lot of the, these people that are in a volunteer administration function are, are, are often on their own in terms of um, the, the work they're doing in the organization. They're, they're given a mandate to go do their work and they don't get a lot of support that might be particularly helpful to them. And that's been true in this, uh, in this changed environment where they've got to figure out how do I use various kinds of technologies, either desktop technologies now from home when I no longer can get to my work office or the use of these information communication technologies to, to engage internally with my staff and volunteers or externally with, with various uh, kind, kinds of audiences. And so one of the kickers from the study that I shared with, with, with Alice and her group is that um, even though these, these volunteer resource managers are largely left to fight battles on, on their own, they, 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 they show an, sort of a high level of um, 
of, of willingness in order to work through problems and, and solve problems in order to uh, continue to get work done. So even though they're concerned about, I mean, a, a specific sort of finding is that they, even though they're, they're concerned about um, whether or not technologies are going to help them carry out particular tasks, but they can get work done using technologies, they, they don't care. They're less concerned with how much work they have to put in to be able to do it. They sort of expect it's going to be hard. They're not going to get the support they need in terms of you know, IT support or, or training. Uh, they know they're going to have to figure things out on their own, but they're willing to do that. So whereas performance concerns matter and whether or not they engage technology, the effort they put in doesn't seem to matter. They're, they're ready to do whatever it takes as long as they have technologies that help them get their work done. Interesting. Huh. So that's where I would classify the field as being incredibly creative and resilient. Yeah, I, I wonder if it's, it also attracts people that are uh, uh, particularly mission driven. I'm not sure I would expect it to find this in a bank uh, yeah. or, you know, a, some other kind of non community kind of a setting uh, where, uh, you know, people are, folks are like, you know, I'm, I'm here for mission oriented kinds of reasons. And even though the path isn't particularly easy for me, I'm willing to put in a little more time and effort in order to make sure that the, that the, that the work gets done. So I think there's a sort of a unique sort of nonprofit environment kind of result here that puts what I say kind of a scope on how my, what I'm looking for applies mm -hmm. in this particular context. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this may be a later question, but since we're being kind of organic, I mean, you're, I, I love that. I love that you're sharing that and really appreciate that, that you have data on that. But, and I, I think it also illustrates, and you were alluding to this too, that, you know, our organizations often don't maybe even understand what is needed to effectively work with volunteers. You know, it's like, there's almost like an expectation or assumption that it just, this just sort of happens by magic. How hard could it be? They're volunteers. Yeah. Um, and, and not recognizing that, you know, this is usually the volunteers are the largest workforce in your organization. You know, they outnumber staff. So your volunteer leader um, is managing more people than anyone else in your organization. And yet they're probably buried in the org chart, not paid the same as other, of other managers of, of similar ilk. Um, and it's, there's this disconnect, right? And they're not included or have a seat at the table on planning. And that's one of the things I feel like if we do anything as a profession, I would love to see that shift because I think there's so, uh, that needs to shift, right? If we really want to do this well and organizations want to benefit from all the amazing energy, skills, talent that our communities have to offer, we have to properly resource it, um, you know, and, uh, you know, you would never bury your philanthropic or your director of philanthropy or your, your fundraiser, but yet the people who are managing those donating their time and sometimes their money too are often short shrifted. So, um, you know, I think that there, and I, I don't even know that it's conscious by executives and nonprofits. I think it's just, it's an, a, not, a, not a lack of understanding and not even recognizing that, that there's this disconnect. And I think we need to solve for that. Agree. Uh, and I think that's kind of a theme. I mean, I don't know how many takeaways we'll have from this kind of panel um, or various ones like it, but I think this theme needs to come up repeatedly across these kinds of, of discussions. And you, I mean, in our, in our first question we we're talking about here, here 10 minutes ago, I was commenting that if you're working virtually, if you're a volunteer administrator that's working from home, you're that much more removed. Well, I, you know, it's because of, I, 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 you know, I'm alluding to that same point, right? You can't be it, you got to be visible in order to get respect. Uh, yeah. and, and respect is a hard thing to build for volunteer administrators. And so we need to move in a we need to move in the right direction. And I think that's a problem right now. Yeah, yeah. and I think it's interesting too, just to quickly uh, jump in and then build off this question a little bit, because I feel like this is a point that has been discussed for years. Um, and Mark, I know, has yeah. talked about it in different work you've done. Um, in the first VMC in the early 2000s, and you know that it's something that is still persists. This 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 fight for visibility, this fight for kind of legitimacy within the organization, and you know I think it's a theme that you know also comes up in the second VMC that you did that was from 2019. But I just wanted to raise a point from that um, study that uh, Mark and Jeff Rudney did. Um, with data from pre-pandemic, but the data pre-pandemic was suggesting that the largest group of 
organizations surveyed, about 41% or so, had a volunteer, a designated volunteer administrator um, or a person doing that role, but they spent less than 50% of their time doing it. So one of the things that I was thinking about in this question about, you know, how um, the volunteer engagement leader role has shifted within the organization is just, you know, the extent to which they've lost even more of their time that's dedicated to that and how that has looked um, and whether we're going to rebound from that um, post pandemic or whether it's going to be increasingly, you know, less time spent on that role. And it's speculative. Um, but I would love to hear from you all about what you think about that. Hmm. Yeah, let, let me amplify a little bit and then I'd love to get Melissa and Betsy's uh, reactions to that. Yeah, Allison's pointing to a big point that we made back in, in 2003 and couldn't help but make it again uh, because it's, I think it's a, it's a nice sort of descriptive nugget about the field writ large. And that is, um, even though you have across sort of your largest organizations, a professionalized group of, of CBAs, although I'll mention there's less than a thousand CBAs in, 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 uh, in, in the United States and Canada. So it's not a huge class of folks. It's mostly a uncredentialed, largely unprofessionalized, uh, make it up as you go along, uh, kind of a kind of a workforce. I mean, not in the largest ones. I mean, not not Melissa, not in your organization, certainly, but you know, the more typical situation is uh, it's, you know, we're just plugging somebody in there that's gonna spend 30% of his or her time working with the volunteers and the other 70% of time, you know, answering phones at the front desk, you know, so it's, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of this largely unprofessionalized uh, kind of thing. I think that's an issue for uh, engagement with volunteers in our communities and for the visibility of the field as a whole. And I, I think the field thinks so too. I don't think I'm, you know, I've ever said anything new in this regard. If you look across, oh, I don't know, is it engaged? Is it CCBA? And they'll look at sort of strategy and, and a lot of it will have to do with how do we increase our visibility and standing? How do we communicate better with boards and, and internally with top management teams about what we do? And you know, how do we calculate ROI in order to have an advocacy position in order to generate more resources? So people think about these things because they know it's a, it's a problem either in their organization or for, for so many of their peers. Uh, Allison says, are we taking a step backwards? And I, th I think first we don't know because you know, we don't have pandemic or post-pandemic kind of data to compare, but, you know, I, I'm right with her hypothesis there. I suspect, you know, given all the, the things that we've talked about so far, that um, that uh, volunteer administrators have taken a step back in, in their or individual organizations in terms of prestige uh, and in terms of the amount of time uh, that they're able to spend uh, working with volunteers. Will we be able to recover that? I guess we'll rebound uh, back to uh, you know pre-pandemic levels, uh, maybe fairly quickly, maybe in the coming year. Um, but I don't know that that's a celebration. It's always been too low, in my opinion. Um, hopefully, we'll get back to that. Will we have a reason to rebound above that? Not as far as I can tell. I don't know what's coming at us that would cause us to have a big leap in volunteer administration. We've been fighting this. We've been fighting this question, you know. I've only been concerned about it for 20 years. I'm sure it's been there longer than that. Um, I don't know what it's going to take in order to uh, push volunteer administration into a more professionalized and respected spot. And I, I don't want to step over you, Melissa, if you wanted to speak to that. Okay. Um, I would just, I 100% agree. And I think it's a little bit of a chicken or an egg scenario too. It's like, I'm hope, I'm kind of hopeful, although I guess we'll see that you know, I, I do hear from organizations who, who really miss their volunteers and they feel like in order yeah. for their organizations to grow and provide all the amazing services they do, they, they recognize that they have really missed that support from volunteers and they need it. So I'm kind of hopeful that in a way, I almost feel like they need, it, need to feel a little pain because I feel like the, 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 the leaders of those organizations, I, I, this is the Pollyanna optimistic side of me and it may not play out, but I'm hopeful that some of them will at least recognize 
oh, wow, we really do need to support this so that in the future this never happens again. Because we do, as we open back up or we begin to expand, we're going to need that community support in order to deliver on our mission. Um, but I, I think that's still to be seen. I mean, I know that's something that, um, and I should mention, you know, we're, uh, I, I wear a few different hats. And one of my hats is working with the Leedy Foundation. And Jane Leedy Justice has done a lot of preaching of the choir to funders to say, hey, do you ever fund volunteer engagement? You need to be looking at this. The organizations who do this work well, um, they have well supported volunteer engagement and they do it strategically and you have bigger organizational impact and outcomes as a result. Um, and so uh, the work that I've been doing too with the Alliance for Vol um, Volunteer Engagement, the National Alliance for Volunteer Engagement is trying to figure out how do we help convince the CEOs, the executives of nonprofits and funders that this is worthy of support and that they actually get a return on their investment when they provide proper staffing, proper resources, they, there is a true benefit to that. Um, and a, a number of us, including UJ Federation of New York, um, uh, the Alliance, Leedy Foundation, Lodestar, and Volunteer Match are coming together to do some research with the Do Good Institute over the next six months to look at this and ideally surveying um, nonprofit leaders and funders to say, you know, what do you think of this issue? How or do you or do you not support this and why? Um, so hopefully come next summer, we'll have some data around it because I do feel like we need to be able to hold up to say, how many, like what further data can we provide of how many are supporting this? Where do these volunteer managers live? And what do the CEOs, what are the CEOs perspectives of this? I think they give it a lot of, and lip service is a harsh word. I don't mean that to be negative because I think they really believe it. I think they really believe it, but it doesn't play out necessarily in the way the organization acts. At least that's, that's from my perspective. <laughs> that's, that's the definition of lip service though. <laughs> I know, it just sounds <laughs> negative. I hate saying that, but yes. No, and it's and it's hard. You know, I've been um, doing this for almost 25 years and the conversations keep going on and on. We feel like we make a little bit of progress and then we kind of plateau a little bit. You know, conversation picks back up and then we end up going back. I think the challenge has been, you know, we were just talking about this before the session started is that, you know, very few of us grow up wanting to be a volunteer engagement leader, you know, and many of us, you know, fell into the field. When I volunteered for a, a nonprofit doing equestrian therapy, they had asked for someone to work with volunteers. And I said, well, what's the skill set? What do you need? And they were like, well, you have to be organized and good with people. And I'm like, pretty sure it might be a little bit more involved in that, you know, but then I have been on this mission to help professionalize the profession so which is why I don't want to leave because I'm so passionate about it and want to do it the other challenge is that many will use the the position um, as a stepping stone into the organization so you know that tenure may only be a couple of years because if they are a department of one they can't do it by themselves they haven't maybe scooped up great volunteers to help them in that department and then they end up leaving because the support is not there from the organization. So, you know, it, it does become, you know, a challenge. And I think there are some those in the field globally who have been, you know, amazing, you know, to really get the field where it needs to go, but the rest of us need, need to follow. Yeah. Clearly a lot of work still to do. <laughs> I, I got to have a, a, a lunch discussion with the uh, Association of Arizona Museums that a few people had joined for a, for a lunch webinar, and they gave me a reality check. I mean, everything, Melissa, you're saying is true, but it just it, it reminds me how, how you know, the, the, the biggest organizations are, have the biggest, they have the most developed programs, and they have people that they can commit to this, and that's where our greatest chance for professionalization exists. And, and but there's but so many of our organizations are small uh, yeah. and 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 uh, don't have many staff. I mean, most nonprofits have no staff uh, and are only volunteer run. So having a professional volunteer administrator in there is is never going to be an option for the majority of nonprofit organizations. It's a big step just to get one staff person. You know, you really increase the bureaucracy of an organization just to put one staff paid staff person in there. And so here was a museum that was represented in this luncheon that I was doing. And I'm trying to talk about 
you know, the stuff that we're talking about today. And she's like, it's just me. I'm the director of this museum and I do what I can to do a little bit of the volunteer, but all this highfalutin stuff you're talking about, about management practices, you know, I don't care. I'm just trying to, you know, do everything. I got to raise right. money and da, 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 da. So, um, yes, you know, but uh, there's realities for, you know, what the rest of the field looks like. And I think we have, you know, for the larger organizations, we have a responsibility to help those smaller ones. So, you know, we, I've been sitting on a task force for the last three years just to look at um, position descriptions and get higher grades you know, for people. And it was a lot of work to do, you know, and I kept saying, like, we have to be able to help those smaller nonprofits, those organizations, give them hope, you know, to be able that it can be done, but we're, we're not helping them at all. If we're just saying like, well, why can't you do it? Well, and I've been there, I've been in department of one, it is incredibly difficult. Um, mm -hmm. I'm fortunate where I am now, but my heart bleeds for those who are, are just torn and still just surviving. And I, it makes me think too, in order, it makes me wonder, in order for these smaller organizations, I think that's absolutely right. I think, and I think they are really challenged to figure this out. I also think there's a little bit of a lack maybe, or we all need to do a better job collectively of helping to illustrate and demonstrate ideally with data, what the true impact is when you do take those few steps. Because I think like there's almost like a lack of recognition, like and maybe this, there's sort of like a mixed issue because on one hand, you know, some folks have had great experiences with volunteers. Others have not had always such a great experience because they haven't been supported. So in a way, volunteers feel like more of a headache than a help. And so you have all these layers to it that it makes me wonder how much folks really recognize the power of it and why when you do it well, this is what happens. And I feel like that that storyline maybe isn't as clear as it potentially could be to um, help organizations see why they should make the time in some way or another to to make it happen. I don't know if that if I'm articulating that what's in my head very well, but I, I feel like there's something there. Like maybe we haven't as a profession done enough to help share that return on investment. No, you're making perfect sense. You know, it's an argument that I. It's been a, that's been a big theme out of the stuff that I've been trying to communicate for a while. Thing is, you know, from where I, I said, it's hard to, it's hard to get into the heads of more than a handful of people. Um, so, uh, you know, how, how best do you then actually get to the people who matter? And it's often not the people that are paying attention. We're talking about boards and management teams that aren't thinking about volunteers very much, uh, if at all, you know, during the course of their operations. You know, how do you get, how do you get that argument uh, convincingly to them? I think that's a tough question. Yeah, and I think it's a matter of also holding up those that are doing it well and seeing that impact. I mean, we um, I mentioned Jane Justice with the Lee Foundation and the Al National Alliance for Volunteer Engagement. You know, we've been doing some sessions like at the Iowa Nonprofit Conference and Minnesota Council on Foundations um, to try to get in front of folks who normally don't hear about this. And the response, I mean, it's been small effort so far, but trying to figure out how do we start talking to executive leaders and talking to the folks who are funding those organizations to say, are you paying attention to this? Because here's what's possible. And there has been some really good response. And I think there are some great examples that maybe we need to even continue to hold up. I mean, like, I love recently Recently, UJA Federation of New York was sharing, and I have it in my notes here somewhere, that they, you know, they're, they have added, because they're seeing the power of volunteers and how it can transform when done well, their grantees organizations, you know, they've started including intentionally in their grantee applications questions like, um, you know, please, would you like to include a budget line to help support the volunteers who will be helping you with whatever this program is you're applying funding for? Like, how are volunteers helping you to build impact in this program? I'm not saying the wording exactly, but they're actually starting to ask those questions, which is amazing. Like, no one's ever done that before. So I think, gosh, can we hold those folks up and show what impact that's having so others begin to say, oh, maybe I should be asking that, right? Like, it feels like it has to come from a different level because I feel like because the volunteer leaders or the engagement professionals don't always have that access. It almost takes a different approach to start pounding that pavement. We can't always expect, I think, our volunteer engagement professionals to, we do need to expect them to effectively advocate, but I think they need help advocating. I think it needs to come from other executives who are doing this well to tell their peers why it's important. 
And that's interesting, Betsy, when you're talking about the budget line, you know, for the volunteers, which my question to you, Mark, through your research with the ICTs, was that a question with your your groups? You know, do they have a budget to do the things that they need to do? No, I mean we're only we're only surveying CVAs in our case. Right. So we're already, you know, with a class of folks that are working as professionals within their organizations. We didn't ask. Um, I think we can make some assumptions that that group of folks is a little more resourced and professionalized and positioned than your typical volunteer manager is going to be. Um, so I, I both don't know for this group, but I also, if I did, I wouldn't extrapolate to the broader nonprofit sector. Okay, I'd love to hear why Timothy and Matthew are here. If they Would they chime in and tell us what brought them to the session? Sure, I can. I'd be happy to share. So uh, my name is Timothy Hoffman. I'm the director of our ser uh, service learning programs that we have here at Seton Hall University. So it's just been very interesting to hear some of the issues on the volunteer management side from the organizations because we've been working with volunteer manage managers for the last year in this very different space. Um, and we've been making sure that when we do go out and try to send students virtually or now as we're starting to do some in-person programming, that we, that we don't want to overwhelm any of them um, and that we don't want um, we, we don't want to be a burden to the organizations that we're working with. So it's been very, very interesting to just kind of hear some of the discussion that you've been having about this, because as we're looking to uh, go back to whatever normal looks like in the future, uh, we're going to be having these conversations with more uh, volunteer managers, and I just wanted to hear some some perspective uh, from based on my uh, based on the uh, the abstract of the presentation today. I thought this would be a good fit, a good learning opportunity, and so far it has been. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks awesome. for being. <laughs> well, and, um, I'm my name is Matthew Garcia, and I'm. I'm a High Point University student, and um, I've been interested in like going into the nonprofit sector. So, like mostly like, and I'm sorry, I'm just a bit nervous. Oh, don't, we don't bite. <laughs> well, I'm well. I'm so, so, I'm kind of interested in like in the like like the volunteer sector, and wanted like to get in like learn a little bit more, like, especially like how, how volunteering ha has changed since, well, since we're in this COVID situation. And I believe this is a, quite an interesting session. I hope so, Matthew. We you know here in 20 minutes, we'll start to wrap up and I'll be curious, you know, as you've been listening in, if there's any particular theme that jumped out at you, did you learn something new, you know, did we, we provoke your brain in a new direction? So, you know, keep listening and we'll be curious at the end if there's something that, you know, jumped out at you. You know, we'll, we'll talk about a dozen different things, you know, over this hour and a half, but I'm curious, you know, which one, which one is gonna sort of, uh, you know, uh, you know, jump into your head. Yeah. yeah. And I'd be interested in what you're seeing as well in your own work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Allison, where are we going next? Yeah, so I think that, you know, we've talked about a lot of different things. Um, you know, I think that one of the questions that I was on my mind, and, you know, I think we've touched on it in various ways, but I would just like to kind of address it a little more explicitly is just whether we think that what we have are these, these current best practices whether those are still relevant um, for volunteer engagement leaders and what we see as, if not, like what we see as changing about our current best practices and, and what we see um, the changes might be going forward. And I know we've talked about how difficult it can be, you know, to even, you know, for in talking about this, just the, the different sizes of organizations really matter a lot that we have best practices. But as Mark mentioned, when you're an army of one, it's like, I'm just trying to like get, all the things done. Like, I don't even have time to, um, you know, think about these things. And so recognizing that that's a challenge, but just what do we see as sort of the changes, if any, to what these best practices might be going forward for the, the profession? 
I didn't have any epiphanies as I thought through this question, Alice. And I, my notes is just to say that all the old rules apply. There's some sort of some best practices or best ways that uh, that uh, suggested practices apply in particular organizations. And I think those those generally apply. Uh, organizations just have to be a little bit more creative right now in this very odd environment about how best to communicate with volunteers or to give good experiences to their volunteers. You know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna vet? How are you gonna match? Uh, how are you gonna supervise? And you know, it's a kind of a, a, a very strange environment. So um, I, I, think, I think the practices still apply. Uh, maybe the way we do them is a little bit different. Uh, will it be different going forward? Um, and again, I don't know. I, I think as I worked through this, I got more and more pessimistic um, that, um, well, uh, we'll, I think we, we hope that we'll return to something like a normal when the pandemic has fully waned, but I don't know that we want to return to a normal because we had so many shortcomings in the field about our, our practices and how we best engage our volunteers. Will we make improvements? Well, maybe there's some hope in terms of, you know, the way we're engaging technologies now we maybe take the best from it. And I, I think I have some remarks for that going down the road here uh, with, the, with the rest of our questions. But as far as uh, practices adoption now and in the pandemic, I think it's just some version of what we've always done. I would agree. Um, I think the one area where, and I, maybe this is the next question, so I don't want to jump ahead. Melissa may have more to add here. Is I think the the illustration of the issues with um, DEI diversity. I think that is a big area that we'll see some in terms of our best practices. How that perhaps is putting up barriers to folks. Maybe we didn't recognize before and may not have realized until all of the last two years happened. But Melissa, you may have others to offer on this. Yeah, and I just echo with what Mark was saying, like the what we've been doing has not changed. It's just been done in a different way. We were always relying on volunteers to be the eyes and ears of the organization. And when they couldn't come in for a little while, we ended up being their eyes and ears for what the organization was looking like. So I would take, um, you know, pictures to show them what, you know, the front entrance would look like, what the waiting areas would look like, um, you know, to let them know that you, you still have a place, but it just paused right now. And I was glad that we were able to, you know, slowly integrate volunteers back in June and July of 2020 before I got approval from leadership because I wanted them to see again the impact of what volunteers could bring and then get that you know get that permission um, and then I think you know the best practice was just to really enhance the technology um, I don't think I will ever go back to face-to-face -to -face onboarding again I think we've been able to really curb some time um, with doing virtual sessions but being able to work with the volunteers um, and then the other thing that has been really interesting for us is how we recognize volunteers. So we were always used to doing things, you know, in a, in a traditional format, but, you know, really, how do we thank those who are working across the country making calls to patients, you know, and how do we recognize them? So that has been a very fun thing to do over the last year and a half to two years. Um, definitely something I've, I know I've upped my game on, um, you know, for, for that piece of it, so. Yeah, thanks for that. And Betsy already kind of alluded to this next question, but I think we'll just go right to it. Um, so how has COVID-19 further influenced access to volunteer opportunities? And to build on that, what should we be focusing on to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion among volunteers, as well as volunteer um, administrators and volunteer engagement leaders. Well, since I alluded, I'm happy to kind of help kick off a little bit of the conversation. I mean, I, th I think, um, I just, I love that it has really shown a light on this issue. I mean, this is something that has been a, of interest to me for many years. Actually, when I was at Humane, I used to be with the Humane Society of the United States nationally, as you mentioned, and one of our programs, um, one of the big programs we were running was called Pets for Life, where, and it still exists, where uh, we were targeting at least four communities, although many other organizations were targeting even more, to provide 
free access to spay, neuter, and other services for pets in underserved communities. And obviously we found, and we were, we were in Philly, Chicago, Los Angeles, um, elsewhere. And we often those underserved communities are by and large um, people of color. You know, uh, the communities we were in were um, predominantly African-American or Latino. And I think even before, you know, diving into doing consulting on volunteer engagement, I was seeing in the programs we were trying to run, you know, there, there are a lot of issues when it comes to uh, organizations going into underserved communities and trying to engage underserved communities. I mean, I think I learned a lot in that process in terms of even just our language, like our field and the animal welfare field would go in and say, we need to educate the community and tell them how to handle their pets. It's like, no, we don't. Actually, we need to go. We all need to share information because we need to learn from them. They need to learn from us. We need to connect people. It's not about swooping in and saving, recognizing these folks are doing a lot of amazing work on their own. They just may not be connected to organizations outside their neighborhood because there are barriers. And I think it, for me, was a real enlightening time, you know, coming from the suburbs myself of recognizing, right, like it's different. And uh, by and large, our volunteer communities uh, tend to be middle class white and and you know a lot of times we're not representing even our nonprofits are not representing the communities that they serve and there's good reason for that I mean I think it's it, and hopefully there's more desire to do it too but I, I I don't even know if it was a lack of desire it's just maybe a lack of understanding and that some of the processes and best practices we employ as leaders of volunteers inadvertently are barriers to those who may want to otherwise participate. I mean, things like a background check. I mean, you people like, uh, like me may not recognize that in, in a community where there's a high number of immigrants, they may be fearful of doing background checks, or if there's some level of, you know, a criminal history, even if it's a pretty benign one, they may be fearful or simply just distrusting of people wanting that information because they are a, a marginalized community. And I think we don't even recognize, and I think we have to be mindful of that. And we have to do a lot of listening and understanding how can we help people overcome barriers. I mean, a lot of people don't have cars, so we expect them to come. Hopefully some of the Zoom technology helps, at least most people could do it on their phone, but even that is a barrier if folks don't have good access to high-speed internet. So I think there's just a lot of things that we take for granted when we're leading volunteers that we may not recognize are making it really hard for people in communities we may want to have working with us to do so. So I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> I would love to hear from both, you know, Mark or Melissa, what you're seeing or how you, what you're thinking and, and feeling about that issue. Well, you actually just made the main point I want to make, so I'll just un underline it and talking about how what we're thinking about right now. Uh, so I mentioned these focus groups we did in the spring and summer of 2021, and this graduate student I'm working with, who is awesome, named Rachel Nova, uh, who I'm working with most days. Uh, and we finished what we call coding these focus groups. So we have, you know, these, you know, hundreds of pages of transcripts of, of, of these focus groups. And we just go through them word by word, line by line. I mean, we're not coding words, we're coding concepts, right? And what's coming up out of the narratives. And we're, we look for specific things that we're focused on in the research. But inevitably, we're going to see things. People are going to talk about things that we really hadn't expected or that we, that we weren't looking for. And this question of, we call it access, it's A isn't part of DEI, but I mean, access is sort of fundamental to diversity, yeah. equity, uh, inclusion, right? There ought to be an A probably in there, in there, in there somewhere. Um, and so we, we, it's, it's become a prominent theme. And I think it's an important thing um, that's coming up out of our, our narratives. Uh, and so we pitched to nonprofit quarterly last week, one of the field publications that you all may be familiar with and their editorial team was gonna meet earlier this week. We haven't heard back from them, but I, I suspect they'll go for this because uh, diversity, equity, inclusion has become a big theme at nonprofit quarterly. So we expect that, that they're in their wheelhouse. And what we, we pitched to them is something that's come directly up out of the narrative. It's not like that we, we thought of this, it's that, that you know, the field kept pushing us in this direction. And it's, it's, it is this exactly this distinction that Betsy was just making at the end of her comments. It's a pro and con kind of a thing. And we're focused most of what we're seeing is mostly is in, 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 in use of 
what I was calling earlier information communication technologies that could be social media that could be um, that could be zoom or teams in order to interact with your publics with your volunteers or your or, or your other stakeholders and on the one hand and again here I'm just sort of saying what Betsy was just saying uh, it provides it can provide access I mean our zoom right now is an example right Betsy where are you physically Maryland yeah and Melissa you're in the Pacific Northwest right now I'm in my hotel room in Atlanta. <laughs> oh, we're all here in Atlanta. Well, let's go have some. Let's go have a, some coffee for lunch. Well, anyway, so at least you know some of us here here in Atlanta, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, but Betsy, you're not, and I guess that's the point. So you know, our communication technologies can 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 reduce these barriers, and we have all kinds of conversations and narratives about what what uh, social medias and communication technologies brought in terms of uh, providing access to people that normally might not have access uh, and how that can be good in a non-pandemic kind of environment. The flip side though, that we, we need to not ignore is the, um, is the technology gaps, that there's unevenness in people's access to technology. Think about the people that aren't in the room now or couldn't be in the room for whatever reason. Uh, that may be a money issue, but it may be a technology access uh, issue. And it is for many people, about prospective volunteers in, in uh, often poor communities, usually a money issue uh, that's related to the access uh, to, to technology. And if there's unevenness of access, then there's, there's a diversity, equity, inclusion uh, issue. And that's a theme that, that, that came up. Uh, the kicker, we think, uh, or the sort of conclusion that Rachel was, was selling to the, the nonprofit quarterly is this idea that uh, in the pandemic, nonprofits kind of, kind of had to whiplash. You know, you get hit with this pandemic and you have to react quickly. And we, we whiplashed hard over to the con side. It's like adopt these technologies now on the fly and let's make the, make the best of it. And we got some benefits out of it, but we really accentuated the cons. The people that were gonna be excluded because of technology gaps were really excluded. And we didn't really have the time to think best through how do we be more inclusive with our communication technologies. But as it wanes, uh, as the pandemic wanes, as we have a chance to be a little bit more reflective and strategic about what were the good things about technology use in the pandemic and how do we use it going forward and how do we be more inclusive going better, that we'll be able to balance a little bit more and take more advantage of the pros going forward and minimize the cons in terms of, of DEI. So even though I said, you know, I'm sort of pessimistic about the future, um, I think our technologies have some, some value with some strategic reflection going forward in our organizations to uh, increase both access and to be more inclusive of, of people that have problems accessing technologies. And that's a good point. You know, while I, I liked how you said whiplash, I kind of like that better than pivot, Mark. Um, you know, and, and we were trying to do things even with like our youth volunteers over the summer to give them an opportunity to give back. And, you know, I'm in the heart of West Philly, which isn't, you know, the best area. And, you know, some of the students were like, I, I have to get to the library and the library's closed. So how can I, you know, yeah. still give back? So, you know, while we were shifting, you know, to do all of this great technology, we still had to go back to our traditional ways of things that we were always doing pre-pandemic, you know, like mailing the application, putting an envelope in there so that they can mail it back to us so that we were able to, you know, do that. So while we thought we were like light years and, you know, and keep moving, there was still this group that was like, but I, I still can't participate you know, because of, of the direction you're going in, where some of the things still had to remain the same in some way. No, so it was very no. eye-opening to hear all of these things that were, you know, coming at us. Yeah, and I'm thinking too about just, you know, how, you know, you wanted to use technology to keep the, the volunteers that you already had engaged, right? So it's like a retention, a retention strategy, but also going forward with what Mark was saying, you know, reflecting on the use of these technologies and how we'll continue to use them, you know, also thinking about how those technologies can also help with re recruitment, right, going forward, that it's not just about retaining the folks that we had pre-pandemic and keeping them engaged so that when we are able to open our doors again, they'll still be around, but also, 
you know, do we see that this is opening up possibilities for actually bringing even more people into our volunteer um, force than we had previously, you know, so, so actually having these opportunity um, for people who never actually want to set foot in the organization, but do want to get involved. And even expanding the geography of where our volunteers come from, too. I mean, now it's like more than ever, you know, I could volunteer. I'm on the East Coast, but I could probably volunteer for an organization on the West Coast if they've gotten more savvy about how they do technology, right? It doesn't require, a lot of times we think just our local community. And I think this is an opportunity to think much bigger than that and really tap a different level of volunteer expertise out there. Interesting. Yeah, so I think, you know, I kind of want to just have one more kind of prepared question um, and then we'll kind of see if there's any audience final thoughts or questions. Um, but something I'm really interested in and uh, Melissa and I were interested in when we put this session together was just thinking about, you know, what are the questions that we should be asking collectively as both academics and practitioners um, and what topics do we think, you know, we should explore in the research going forward um, you know, this is our NOVA, so it's, it's a research conference, but we also, um, you know, it's a nonprofit, studying nonprofits is an applied discipline, so we always want to know, like, what are practitioners interested in, what are the implications of our work for management, and so, in your opinions, what are the questions we should be asking, what would you like to see coming out of the research going forward? I'll start because this was this is probably the one that was keeping me up yeah. <laughs> the most. Um, I, I wrote down a, a couple, and we've already talked about this since the session started. Um, but why? And Betsy and Mark, you were talking about this as well as to why some organizations do embrace the volunteer engagement leader, while some are like I just maybe as a collateral duty for someone to be in that role, maybe with not having those skill sets. Um, you know, why Why isn't the need there? Like, why aren't they seeing the need? Um, the other one, you know, because of um, COVID is some of the roles that we will no longer see with volunteers. So there are some that have sunsetted because of COVID as a more emerging volunteer roles have come up. Um, I know for some in my own organization and just talking to those in, in even non-healthcare, we'll never go back to certain volunteer roles, you know, because of, of the pandemic. Um, the other one is the paid staff relationships with volunteers and the rebuilding of a department. So for so long, we haven't had, and I, we collectively with like nonprofits haven't had volunteers in the organization. So is it really out of sight, out of mind? We've been, they, the departments, the staff have been able to shift of not having volunteers there. You know, there's that element of rebuilding the department and the programs you had to really, you know, re-educate people that remember what volunteers used to do for you. Like we, they're ready to go or we can, you know, shift things a little bit. Um, you know, so that has, those are some of the, the questions that have been, you know, kind of burning in, in my mind right now. I'll just pause there. Mark, do you want to go next? I, I think you two will probably cover most of it as research focused folks, but uh, I'd love to hear what you're going to say. Well, I was reading through my notes and like trying to refresh my memory, how I thought about this when I thought through this a few days ago. And uh, I'm not sure there's, I don't have any rocket science here. One of the points, my first point is just, uh, it's just the technology question. I think we haven't thought about that enough. Um, I sort of, I don't know, pat, patting myself on the back that I feel like I've stumbled toward a, a relevant question in the field right now. Uh, and then after I got going, uh, you know, Allison and Melissa contacted me and said, hey, we've been thinking along similar lines that this is a, this is a, this is a question that's relevant to the field right now. Uh, not many people are paying attention to it in any systematic sort of way. Uh, I think there's a lot of fruitful questions that can be asked about uh, uh, technology use uh, to uh, so that organizations or individual volunteer administrators can do their job better to engage volunteers so that volunteers can both make impacts on communities or be more civically engaged themselves. There's a lot of values to volunteering that we can't get if we're not more productive in our, uh, in our engagement with volunteers. And so I think technology can go a long ways there. My second point, it's a, it's a, 
it's a it's sort of a it's sort of a mess. I'm trying to make sense of how best to summarize it, but it's it's not different from how Melissa was starting out there. It's going back to sort of that how the field is viewed and how we how the field can get uh, can get more respect and how it can communicate with with stakeholders, be they funders or board members or top management, be people that hold purse strings or make policy decisions. Um, uh, that allow volunteer administrators to be as effective as, as they might be able to be. Uh, but, you know, it's not so straightforward as that. I think, I think what, I think a road I'd like to get down, we'll see if I actually do, is, and it's, 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 it's hard to write because I think a lot of academics, they, to the extent that we like to have a relationship with the field, right? We want to talk to the field. We want to be relevant. And so we end up being a little bit falling a little bit toward the advocacy side. Mm -hmm. Yay, nonprofits, yay, volunteering, right? Where really academics shouldn't, shouldn't be that. We, we should be a little more objective and try to talk. We, we want to be able to talk as much about the warts as about the, the victories. And I think there's some warts that could be more honestly described uh, about the field of volunteer administration. It's sort of, I mean, there's lots of evidence that's kind of a messy, largely unprofessional, professionalized space with, um, you know, we asked, we asked in our survey, uh, what's your title, Mr. You know, you're, you're, you're the main person who's, uh, you know, managing volunteers in the organization. What's your title? We got a hundred different responses. Of course. You know, we asked, what's your main technology that you're using on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, to work with volunteers and we get a hundred different responses. Yep. So, you know, I guess diversity is good, but, you know, I think it's evidence is sort of a messy, unprofessionalized space. Um, uh, Allison was talking earlier about how few volunteer administrators work at least half their time. And I've long held that if you're not working half of your time doing something, you don't think of yourself as that. You know, if you spend a little time doing so, you're not that. You're whatever you're spending most of your time on. So I think the field is dominated by too little professionalization. And we, you know, the field talks about professionalization and image and internal advocacy and resource development. Uh, uh, but I think uh, the more we can be honest about this is what the field looks like and this is its issues, then I think we can be more productive and thinking about, well, then how do we move beyond that? What are the steps then to overcome some of this messiness that's evident in, in the field right now? So uh, maybe it falls to somebody like me to write something that's a little bit, you know, about writing about the war. It's a little less advocacy oriented and a little more objective about this, the status of the field right now. That's a great, really great insights. And I think too, it, you know, it, it has to be valued, right, too, by those organizations that, and the, the the leaders of those organizations. And I think there, I think it is a bit of a catch-22. So I think writing about that would be amazing. And I, I mean, I mentioned that research earlier that is now, beginning to get underway. We have, we're working on the survey design with Do Good Institute now at University of Maryland. Um, Bob Grimm and Nathan Diaz, I think are both probably at the conference. Um, but it'll be interesting to see out of that, like how do, because that's one of the things like in terms of looking at research moving forward, I am really interested to better understand what's truly going on in these organizations as ecosystems. Not so much what's happening with, I mean, I'm interested in volunteerism, but I'm more interested in, or you know, what's happening inside these organizations what does that look like? And what's happening with the support that they are or are not getting from the funding community and why? Um, because I also think, you know, our CEOs of nonprofits aren't exactly going out and looking for funding to support their volunteer engagement. They just don't even think about it. They would never, they most don't even think about it. And as a result, funders don't even recognize this, this is something that they should consider supporting. And so, you know, I think we have a lot to learn there. I think the other uh, piece, given the pandemic, that I would love to see a focus on is picking apart as we come out on the other side, hopefully, of all of the last two years, a, a better understanding of like which, about what's happened, of course, uh, what, what are the dynamics that have been at play and what have been the impacts, but I'm really curious about like what organizations or sectors were, were successful during this and why, like, or, and who wasn't and why, because I also think that 
will inform what we were just talking about as to 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 what level of support it gets and why. Because I, I think that would be an interesting question to better understand is those who have happened to thrive or at least made it through by keeping most of their volunteer teams intact, what were they doing that was different than those who really had to lay everyone off or, or lost a lot of their volunteers? I mean, I, I intuitively feel like we have enough experience to probably have a good sense of why, but there, I'd love to see data behind that. Are we right? What are some surprising findings there? Right on. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, if either of our audience members want to um, ask a question or just chime in with any concluding thoughts or um, takeaways that you had, I'll open the floor to that. Let me even be more specific. Hey, Matthew, anything, what, what jumped out at you? Do you hear anything over the last hour that uh, took your brain in a new direction? Well, maybe he's not. We might have lost him. Or maybe Timothy. I see Timothy is texting oh, or chatting. Matthew, you just, Matthew oh, just he's dead. Oh, I'm sorry. Come, was... come back. Come back, come back. Matthew. Maybe you. next time. Okay, there he's back. Matthew. Yeah, sorry about that. It, it somehow like legend got, took me out of the meeting. Did you, uh, anything you heard over the past hour that uh, was gonna stick in your brain? Well, I think uh, like, I guess like how you mentioned like the, the technology thing that like some people, if I, if I believe I heard this right, like some people aren't able to like get in the like technology to work properly, is that right? Yeah, and that's right on. Yeah, quite an interesting point. And it's not going to be an easy fix because I mean, it costs uh, most technology costs a lot. You know, I was reading an article or scanning through an article that I found earlier this week about homeless youth, and I was surprised in this article how many of them had access to technology. I'm thinking homeless youth, no way that they're they're using social media or whatever, but smartphones have gone a long ways. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know how this works exactly. If you're homeless, how do you pay for your smartphone? But, you know, lots of homeless kids have phones that allow them to have access to the internet. And so uh, that's really helped to decrease the technology gap, I think. So just an anecdote. I think there's hope. I think, you know, technology is going to find a way for us in the 21st, 20th century. Yeah. <laughs> So, hey, Timothy, any reactions? I think that the technology thing's an interesting thing to explore. Cause, and, and we've seen it with our, some of our work here where some, some of the nonprofit partners that we've had didn't have the capability to take on volunteers in a way that they previously had. So I would be interested to see kind of what research would look like um, into that to see the capacity for organizations to take on volunteers in, in a virtual space. Uh, has that improved over the last year? Uh, I'd imagine it has in certain regards, but where has it not? And what, what are some of the barriers to inc improving that access? So, so some really interesting questions that came up today. Interesting. I hadn't considered that. You know, I think people, a lot of people are going to assume that if, you're, if, you're, if you've got a virtual volunteering platform, that reduces problems of, of, of numbers, right? I mean, you can maybe only manage 100 people that are cleaning up a park, but you could have 10,000 people that are coding craters on Mercury or whatever your virtual assignment is going to be. But that may not be true. You know, maybe, all, maybe have kind of all kinds of burdens, um, either electronic or, 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 or staff time in terms of managing volunteers effectively in a virtual space. It's not something I've thought through at all. Yeah. Definitely something that will be unique. It will be. It will yeah. be interesting. Right on. Yep. Allison, what do you think? Well, I think that we're almost out of time. So I just wanted to uh, conclude by thanking you all for participating. I think we've raised a lot of really interesting points and questions here. Always more questions than answers, but I think that's what's exciting. Um, you know, there's 
opportunities to kind of explore these things going forward. Um, you know, I, I also agree that technology piece is particularly interesting, especially within that context of access, as you said, Mark, and I'm really interested to see, um, you know, where that goes. And also, Betsy, your point about funders and funders not considering volunteer um, volunteering as something worth funding, or maybe they just haven't been approached about it. I think that's also really important and not something I'd considered mm -hmm. either. So, you know, what, what that can look like um, as well, if, if we are able to get, you know, managers advocating to funders that this is something that should be part of a grant, um, you know, and, and what that will look like. Um, especially, I think, too, if we can couch that in the context of access and DEI, because that's so relevant right now, um, you know, that could be another way to kind of you know, make the case for, for um, funding volunteering and by extension volunteer administration and the people who do that work. So I'm, I think this is all, this has all been really interesting. I'm really excited about it. I've taken a lot of notes uh, and thanks to our audience for being here and for your great, your great questions and, and comments at the end. Um, and with that, I think that we reached our time. Um, so thank you all and um, I'll see you around the conference and